Thank you guys so much. So again, today we are continuing in our series. The series, uh, it's a three-part series. Today, actually, we're finishing off the series here, and we're actually going to finish off um, Philippians chapter 3 today as well. I know you guys thought we weren't going to ever get done with Philippians chapter 3. We're finishing it today. Now, again, the series title is Joy in Your Future. And we're talking about how God wants you to step into a future of joy, that God, as our Heavenly Father, you know, wants His kids to be joyful. There, any good father wants his kids to have joy in their life. And the Bible tells us this. If you look in Jeremiah 29, verse 11, God talks about the plan that he has for us. He has a plan of joy. He has a plan of hope for our future. It says, for I know the plan I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. I want you to know that God has that for each and every single one of us. And I talk to people sometimes, and as they're going through a tough time, sometimes they go, are you sure that's for me? Absolutely. Absolutely. Specifically because that verse was actually written to the Israelites when they were in captivity in one of the darkest moments of their life. Now, they put themselves there because they went against God. But here's the thing. Either way, God, even though they're the ones that got themselves in that situation, God didn't just give up on them. God didn't go, hey, you get what you get. You don't throw a fit, right? God never did that. Instead, God said, look, I know you're in this mess, and I still have a plan for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. So if you're in the middle of a difficult situation, know that, that God has a plan for you. You know what's interesting is right after that, actually two verses after this, in verse 13, the Bible also talks about kind of our responsibility about it. It says there, you will seek me and you will find me when you search me with all your heart. So God says, hey, yes, I have a plan. Yes, I have a purpose, but there's, there's your responsibility. Are you seeking me with all your heart? See, there are times when we want to step into the plan that God has for us, but we're not seeking God with everything we've got. And so that's what this series is about right now. This series is about stepping into that with everything we've got. And so we've been looking at how the Apostle Paul is showing us, is demonstrating that through Philippians chapter 3. So let's go ahead and look at our key text for today. It's Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. And then we're going to continue on today uh, with verses 15 through 21, because that's how we're going to wrap up today's message. This is, this is the text we've been looking at for the last two weeks. It says, the Apostle Paul says this, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for, for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. He says, look, I want to reach what Jesus you know, chose me for. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. Look, I'm not there yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on you know, toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He's like, look, here's one thing. I want you to understand something. And this is so important. And I'm going to tell you why this is important in my, my third point today. He says, I'm not there yet. He says, not that I've already arrived. Not that I'm already made perfect. He says, but I press on. I don't give up. I keep moving forward. Not that right now is a perfect situation because he's in prison for loving Jesus and he's in a very difficult situation. He's like, look, but I'm going to keep moving forward. I'm not going to give up. There might be walls around me, bars around me, but God still has a plan and God's going to get me through. You know, the apostle Paul, he made the biggest difference in his ministry while there were bars around him because that's when he wrote the letters that he wrote that, that we still read about today that 2,000 years later are still transforming people's lives. You know, when we look at it as a trap, God says, I can still do something through that. And so, so the apostle Paul says, look, we can still step into a life of joy. The book of Philippians is the book of joy, the book of hope. And so we talked about, you know, we're looking at three different things, three different areas, principles uh, that we can step into to have the joy that God intended for us. So we covered two already. The first one we covered in part one was we need to fear complacency, that we need to get away from being complacent. There's a difference between complacent and being content. A lot of people use con the word contentment to just stay where they are. Like, like there's no progress in their life and they're like, oh, I'm just content. No, you're not. You're lazy. Right. I mean, there, there's a difference right there. Complacency is just saying, hey. I, I'm just going to stay right here. And I've had people tell me, look, that maybe this is just me. They're stuck in an issue. They're stuck in a problem. Maybe they have an addiction. There's something in their life. And they just go like this. I guess this is just me. This is how God made me. No, 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 no. If it's not a part of God's will in God's word for your life, then, then I got to tell you, that's not how God made you. That's the enemy trying to convince you of that. So we don't become complacent. We keep striving to move forward. 
The second thing we talked about is we need clear commitment. The Apostle Paul says, one thing I do, one thing I do, that we have to have a clear commitment of things. You know, there are often times when our prayers aren't even clear. Have you ever just prayed very generally? You know that God doesn't want you just to pray generally. He wants you to pray very specifically. Because there are times we go, God, please bless me. And then God is blessing you like crazy. But because you're looking at this one thing that you haven't prayed specifically about, you, look, you don't see all these 10 things that God is blessing you on, but you look at the one that he's not. It, it's the craziest thing. And then we go, well, God's not answering our prayers. God's like, are you kidding me? So there are times when we got to just be very specific with God and say, God, clearly, here's what I need help with. And you watch God be, answer your prayers. God's amazing. He might not answer the way you want. I want you to know that, right? There are times we go, God, help me win the lottery. Very specific. These are my numbers, right? And God's going, no, no, no. I'm going to open up an opportunity for you at a job instead. I'm going to find this other way for you to, to bless your life, right? So God will have ways that he'll answer our time of need. Now, today, what we're going to talk about is this, that we need to learn to defeat discouragement. That if you're going to have joy in your life, you've got to learn to defeat discouragement. Let me read you the definition here of discouragement in the dictionary. It says this. Discouragement means this. A loss of confidence or enthusiasm being dispirited. Like you just you lost your umph. You lost your enthusiasm. You were excited at one point and you've lost it. Have you ever felt that way about your faith? Absolutely. I know if we we're all honest, we'd be, I know it'd be the wave in here, right? Absolutely. We, we, we've all been there. When we start on fire, I still remember when I gave my life to Jesus and I said, Jesus, I'm all in. Came out of that water. I was baptized, came out. I'm like, yes, yes. And I remember I was like that everything changes. My whole perspective is going to change forever. And I got to tell you, then life smacks you in the face. And there are times when you lose that enthusiasm. There are times when, when you felt like you were on fire and then all of a sudden your fire seems to have dwindled a little bit. You get a little discouraged. So today, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the formula to beat discouragement. That if you apply these things to your life, I'm not saying you won't be discouraged. We're going to be discouraged. Listen, we're, we're on enemy territory. There, you know, the enemy is, you know, is very present. The Bible talks about that. That Satan's going to mess with you. So you're going to have times of discouragement, but how do you not stay discouraged? How do you defeat it? See, to defeat it means it's there. It's present. You're feeling it, but then you keep moving forward. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to look at four principles to defeat discouragement. Principle number one is the principle of conservation. The principle of conservation. To, to, uh, conservation means to preserve, to, uh, to protect, to not go backwards, right? If you're conserving something, it's not getting worse, it's like you're, you're at least keeping it the same. Because here's the thing. Th there's nothing more discouraging than putting a whole lot of effort into something and you feel like you're going backwards. You know, have you ever felt this way in life where you take one step forward and then a situation happens, it feels like it takes you two steps back, right? It's like that Paul Abdul song. I take one step forward, you take two steps. Oh, anyway, all right. I, I don't sing. All right, so, but here's the thing is that there, there's this thing in, in, our, in our life that there are times when we feel that way, and that's so discouraging. Like, I'm moving forward, and I'm trying, but man, it's like every single time. It's almost like trying to run on a slip and slide. Like, I'm going, but it feels like I'm not getting very far. And so the Apostle Paul says, listen, listen, that when it comes to our faith, that the effort you put in is not being wasted. He says, so keep putting in the effort. Listen to what he says here in verses 15 and 16 of our text. It says, let us therefore, as many as are perfect. Who here is perfect? Don't raise your hand. God will, bam, right now. Right? So it says, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if anything uh, you have, a, if any, anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. Now, I love this text. There's so much in this text. So he said here, first of all, for those of you, those of us who are perfect. Now, let me first of all say, this is a bad translation, English translation of the Greek word. Okay? So the actual Greek word is telias. Telias. Which means mature. He said, so to those of us who are mature in our faith, we need to have this attitude. Which attitude? He just talked about it. 
He said, hey, I'm going to press on. I haven't attained it. I'm not there yet. This side of eternity, we, we haven't reached perfection, so we're going to keep moving forward. I'm going to press on. I'm going to reach. He says, have this attitude. And then he said this. It was so cool. He says, now, if you have a different attitude than this, then um, I'm praying that God will reveal that to you. Here's what he said. So awesome. He's saying, if your attitude isn't to keep pressing on and you're a mature Christian, you're wrong. I love that about him, but he said it really nicely, right? He's like, you're wrong. But here's what he did say as well. He says, but I'm not going to argue with you about it. I'm going to pray that God reveals that to you. Have you ever been in a situation where you try to argue someone into seeing it from your perspective or seeing like, like you're trying to walk them through? Like it's, it, when you look at your relationship with God and you, it, it looks so simple. It's like, it's just take this step. I mean, it's so simple. Just do this. Have grace, have mercy, have love, right? I mean, keep moving forward, keep growing. And then someone else, they're not quite there yet. And you try to, you know, get them and, and tell them and tell them and tell them. And it, it, it gets frustrating. Can I tell you something? You're not going to argue someone into heaven. You're not. You don't have the power to change someone's heart. Now, the Bible does talk about speaking the truth in love, that we need to you know, have answers for people, but then we need to pray. We need to drop on our knees and say, God, make it clear to them. So if you have someone in your life that isn't where they need to be, instead of trying to argue with them, let's ask ourselves, are we dropping to our knees and begging God to help them to see clearly? He says, look, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm going to pray that God helps you to see this. And then he says this, he says, and I'm going to pray that you keep living by the standard that you have already obtained, right? So he says, you've already attained this standard. Here's what he's saying. Don't go backwards. Don't go backwards. He, keep pushing. You know, I don't know if you've ever done this. I, I've done this, whether it's in the mall or I've done it at the airport. Uh, where you get on an escalator, and I'm sure people were really annoyed with me. But if you go on an escalator, have you ever tried to go the other way on an escalator? Like, it, like if you're at the bottom and the escalator is a down escalator and you try to walk up it, have you noticed that you have to walk faster than the, down, than the escalator is going down? If you don't walk faster than it, you're not going to get very far. But let's just say that you walk faster, right? You're, and you're getting on there and you're like, man, I'm going, I'm going. And you're getting halfway and you get three quarters of the way. And you're like, yes, look, how, look at this. And do you know that if you get to that point, you don't get to the top, you get right to that point just before the top, and you stop walking. You don't stay there at the top. It starts taking you back down. Do you know that this world, when it comes to our faith, is a downward escalator? I mean, we can just see it through clear eyes all around us. I mean, there's a tug that happens in our life as we're trying to pursue Jesus, and the world is trying to pull us in that opposite direction. And so the Apostle Paul, he says, look, you've got you've to put in effort just, just to maintain. On a downward escalator, if you get to a certain point, you can't just stop. You've got to keep, at least stay at the pace that you're at in order to stay in that spot. And who is he talking to? He's talking to mature Christians. For all of us who are mature, he says, don't think you've arrived. This side of eternity, you're still on the escalator. While you're physically in this world, you're on the escalator. You know when you get to the top? When we're with Jesus in heaven. That's when we get there. That's when we can go, cool, I've made it. But until then, we don't stop pushing. And that's what he said. He goes, look, first principle, you want to step into joy? The principle of conservation. Don't stop pushing. The second thing is this. The second principle is the principle of imitation, of imitation. Now, I used to coach football, uh, Pop Warner football, and then I did one year of high school football. And one of the things that I would do, like the first like, couple weeks of practices and stuff, what I would do is I'm working on fundamentals. That's it. I mean, I'm not trying to get all fancy. It's like every kid, you know what they want to do? They want to do all the fancy stuff. I want to do the one-handed catch. I want to run through everybody. I want to run, you know. And so they all have the same thing. Like they want to do all the spectacular stuff. And here's what I tell them. You can't get to the spectacular until you get the fundamentals down. Right? And so then what I do is I, I bring them and I try to teach them fundamentals. Fundamentals of tackling, fundamentals of, of running, protecting the ball, holding the ball where it needs to be, catching, right? And so, um, so I walk them through all that stuff. And if they're not getting it, 
what I do is I pair them up with someone. Like, I'll bring someone who's maybe been, uh, is further along, and I say, hey, show them how to do this. And so they show them the right stance. They show them whether it's on the line or whatever it is, right? So I walk them through. I always pair them with someone that, that is doing it right because there's incredible power in imitation when someone is doing it right. You know the same thing is true in life? That in life, there are people who are incredible examples as to how to live life. That are, that are living their faith, as the Apostle Paul says, that's, they're stretching, And they're doing their best. And he says, we need to follow that example. Listen to what he said here in verse 17. He talks about the importance of example. He says, brethren, the very next verse, join in following my example. What example was it? The one he said, stretching, moving forward, not settling. And observe those who walk according to the patterns you have in us. He says, and look at other people too who are doing it right. Now, you notice what he said here. Because the first time I read that, it threw me off a little bit. Because I read it kind of quickly, and I went, wait a second. He says, follow my example. The word example means pattern, the pattern of my life. And I thought, wait a second, aren't we only supposed to follow Jesus? And this is what I realized. He's not saying, hey, follow and worship me. He's not saying, it's me as an individual. The, 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 we follow Jesus with everything we've got, but he's saying, but Jesus puts people in our lives that could be an example to us. That you find people that are a little further ahead of you and you, and you reach out to them and you, you get mentored by them. That they will help you go and take your next step in your life. And then he also said, he says, and then I want you to observe others around you as well. He didn't say, just say about himself. He said, but I want you to observe the people that are doing it right. Now, the word observe is the actual Greek word uh, skopeo, skopeo, which is where we get our English word scope. He's saying, hey, find people that are doing it right and scope them out. Now, listen, I don't know if scoping out is the same today than it was when I was growing up. But I remember when I was growing up 20-something years ago, when I saw my wife for the first time, I was scoping her out. I was like, how you doing? And and I wasn't being a stalker, but I was paying attention. See, that's what it means is this, is that you to scope out. It means that you pay attention, and there's different levels of how you pay attention. He, he says, when people are doing it right, look, look, at, if somebody is distant from you, like let's say you don't know, have someone right now that's really close to you, that, that is doing life right in their relationship with God, but you look up to them, you, you're like, man, that's somebody, you know what, that's when you get a telescope. You know what a telescope does? It takes something that's far away, and it brings it closer. It lets you see more detail. You know, uh, or, or if someone is close, you get a microscope. See, a microscope gets you even closer, more detail than a telescope. If you see somebody who has an incredible heart for God, get a stethoscope. And start asking questions. Let me see your heart. You find people that are doing it right. Because I want to tell you something. The Apostle Paul teaches us that we're all going to be influenced by someone. But it's up to us who we allow to influence us. I mean, even great leaders are influenced. People who step in and become great leaders in life, they talk about the influences that they've had in their life. And I'm not talking about perfect people because there's no such thing. There's only one person who has ever walked on the face of the earth that is perfect, and that's Jesus. Everyone else, and the people that the Apostle Paul is saying, look for other people. It does not mean that they're perfect because even the Apostle Paul admitted, hey, guys, when he says, look at my example, he, just before this in verse 12, he says, not that I have already obtained it, not that I have already become perfect, but I press on, but I reach and I stretch and I'm doing all that I can in my relationship with God. See, that's what we need to do. We, we need to find people that are striving to be the people that God intended for them to be. And then the Apostle Paul, so that's what he says in verse 17. But then the Apostle Paul, right after this, he then gives us a warning, which I love this about him. It's like he thinks of everything, right? So he talks about the influences of positive influence. And then right after this, in verses 18 and 19, he starts preparing us for negative influence. Listen to what he says here. He says, for many walk of whom I often told you and now tell you even weeping, it's brokenhearted, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. He said the same way that you have positive influences around you, guess what? You're going to have negative ones. 
And he's talking to people in Philippi. Philippi was a jacked up culture. There was a lot of ugliness. If you looked at Philippi during this time, there was more negative influence than there was positive. So he's preparing them. He's saying, hey, just so you know, there are going to be great positive influences, but there's going to be more negative ones. Doesn't that sound like today's culture, today's society? He says, you've got you to be careful. And he says there, he says, I, I even see this weeping. He says, my heart is broken. It, it breaks for them and it breaks for you that you're going to have to deal with this and you're going to be torn at times. And he says that there are people in this world that are enemies of the cross, that are anti anything that has to do with Jesus, that, that they're anti grace and hope and mercy. He says that's just going to be a part of the world. We know, listen, we know there's a lot of anti the cross today. Anti-Christianity, anti the Bible, anti-God. He says, that's out there. He says, don't be influenced by it. And he tells us some things to kind of know, you know, the, the fruit of their life. He says their stomach, their stomach is their appetite. He says that their stu- it's like he's talking about all the physical stuff, that, that they're chasing after the stuff that just is about them, what they consume, their pleasure. Doesn't that sound like society today? Same thing in Philippi. He says their end is their destruction. He says they're going in the wrong direction. Like, why would we want to follow and be influenced by someone who's going in the wrong direction? You, you think about it. If you know you need to go to a certain place and you know that someone else is going in an opposite direction, but you, that's where you need to be. Like, logically, we don't look at that and go, hey, I'm going to follow them. And I, it's going to get me further away. But yet we do this spiritually sometimes. As we look at our culture, it's amazing that we attach ourselves to things that will actually move us away from the direction that God has for us. He says, don't go there. Their end is going to be destruction. Don't, don't let that pursue you or influence you. He says their glory is to their shame. You know what he's saying here? That they're valuing the things that are shameful. Their values are all messed up. That they look at things that are really bad and ugly and go, no, this is good. This should be acceptable. He says, be careful about that. And then he says that their minds are on earthly things. He says, they're focused on all the temporary stuff. He says, do not be influenced by them. He says, there's, there's a lot of people going in the wrong direction, but there's a lot of people also going in the right direction. Find those people. They're the ones you scope out. The people that are doing it right. Not that they're perfect. Not that they're perfect. Because listen, when you scope anyone, microscope, make sure I say that right. When you microscope anyone, you're going to find imperfections in any one of us. But he didn't say find a perfect person. He says you find somebody who's striving, pursuing Jesus with everything they've got. That's the principle of imitation. The next principle is the principle of separation. So he talks about all the, the stuff of the world. He says, hey, here's the, the positive influences. Here's going to be the negative influences. He says, now here's what I need you to understand, how you stay separated from the negative influences of today. He's like, you got to move. You got to move. You got to do a change of address. I, I remember when I, when I moved down here, um, you know, I used to live up north. And, you know, we had a, a passion, a heart to come down to South Tucson and start a church. And I was like, I need to be closer. You know, when I was up north, you know, in Oro Valley, it was easier for me to jump on the freeway and head up to Phoenix for my engineering job. So that was a lot easier. But then when we came down here and I was like, you know what? I need to be closer. And so we ended up moving. And, and when we moved, we had to do something at the post office. We had to do this, this little card. It's called the change of address. And so you fill that thing out. Now, you try, I try to get a hold of all the people that had all the bills and stuff and say, hey, we're moving. And I gave them, you know, Don's address, not mine. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> So, so, so what I did is I gave, you know, I was like, hey, we're moving. Here's the new address. But just in case I miss someone, so what I did is I filled out a change of address. Now, what's interesting is when the mail came there that was for us to the old address, they would put a yellow little sticker on top that had the new address and said, they don't live here anymore, but we're going to redirect it over to where they are. I want you to know something, that as Christians, when we give our life to Jesus, we don't live in the old address of our past and our brokenness anymore. That people shouldn't find us there anymore. We, we've already moved. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says here about our new address in Christ. In verse 20, 
It says, for our citizenship is in heaven. That's our address now. 777. For which also we eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, your new address is the citizenship of heaven. Now, for us, it can be difficult for us to understand and grasp what he's saying here, but it was easy for the people in Philippi. See, because the people in Philippi, uh, Philippi was a city uh, that was hundreds of miles away from Rome, but it was a Roman colony. So people that were in Philippi uh, were people that were in Rome, and then they, uh, maybe they were, they were in the military for 21 years, and they you know, retired from there. They would go over to Philippi. So Philippi, even though it wasn't Rome, it was a Roman colony, and they still had a lot of the same benefits. They actually spoke Latin. The, the, administ- the way it was administered and ran was all the way Rome did. I mean, they had all these, these uh, benefits, and they lived like they were in Rome, even though they weren't in Rome, because they're like, hey, we are Roman citizens. So even though physically... They were in Philippi. They lived as if they were in Rome. And so when he says, your new address is heaven, he's like, look, you might not be there physically, but you are a citizen of heaven. Your, your, your address has changed. The benefits that you have in life, that your lifestyle, everything, the way you administer your life, the way you live your life should be based on your citizenship that is in heaven. What you do and how you live should be for God. Why? Because we know that this here is all temporary. See, too often what we do is we live like we're citizens of, the, of, of this earth. Whether it's U.S. citizens, I know we have people that watch from all other countries, whatever country you're watching from, like, hey, that's our citizenship. The Bible says that in Christ... We might be physically there, but our citizenship is in heaven. And you know that we have some of the benefits right now that we're going to have in heaven. Let me show you. It's not the full benefits because we still have stuff that's broken. But God's Holy Spirit is right here. God is right here. Oftentimes people go, I can't wait to go to heaven and be with God. God is right here with you right now. Like, like, you don't have to wait for heaven to have God in your life. Like, God wants to be active in your life every single day. Every breath you take, God wants to be there. But sometimes we forget. I think the reason we forget is because we get distracted. And so the Apostle Paul, in the text, he told us where our focus needs to be. It was so incredible. So he talks about our citizenship is in heaven. And then he tells us how you know if you have actually gotten to a state where you understand that. Here's what he said. Here's how you know. We eagerly await for Jesus Christ, our Lord. Are we eagerly awaiting Jesus for him to make things right again? When it's all said and done and we get to be with him in paradise for all of eternity. He says, look, I want you to know that's what brings you joy. You can have joy today because God is right here with you today. He wants to have a relationship with you every single moment of your life. That's where our address is. And then, he, and then let's look at the last principle. The last principle he shows us, which is absolutely incredible, it says the principle of transformation. That if you want to step into a life of joy, it's the principle of transformation. Listen, if you're going through a tough time right now, or a time of uncertainty, a time of doubt, t- time of depression, a time of anxiety, a time of worry, Can I guarantee something to you? I don't do guarantees often, but I can guarantee this. Things are going to change. I mean, things will change. You know, if you look at uh, Heraclitus, who was a Greek philosopher, he actually said something. He said, the only constant in life is change itself. The one thing you'll know is things will always change. And people, unfortunately, are afraid of change. Now, granted, I know that whenever we have a good thing, it, it, change scares us because we don't want to lose that good thing. But do you know that people are scared of change even to step out of a bad thing? Uh, when I was doing the research for, uh, for my message, I found this word, and it was so awesome. I had never heard this word before. I never knew it actually was even a thing called neophobia. Neophobia. It's the fear of something new. 
I mean, there really is a condition of people being afraid of new things. And that's why they get stuck. There are times when people will be stuck in a bad situation. They will settle in. They will become complacent. Why? Because even though things are not good, because they're afraid of stepping into something new. But I want you to know that the newness that God brings us is nothing to be afraid of. The, the, the newness that God wants to step our life into isn't scary. Because I want you to know that when we get to heaven, God makes all things new. All things new. Listen to what he says here in verses 20 and 21 again. It says this, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also uh, eagerly await for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom, here it is, will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. He says that when we get to stand there before Jesus, he's going to turn our, our bodies. You know, it's something, it, the word that was used there is the word humble. It says your humble state. The actual term is uh, uh, tapinosis. It's the Greek word tapinosis, which means your lowly broken bodies. He's going to convert, transform these lowly broken bodies. Now listen, if you're young, you're going, what do you mean? I know. You take me back 20 years ago. Somebody's talk, talked about our lowly bodies. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. I got some abs. Now I have an, an ab, right? <laughs> you know, so it's amazing what happens to our bodies. Now here I am in my 40s, turn 45 in December, and, I, and I'm having some issues. You guys see me? The last couple of weeks I've been limping up here, right? I thought I could still play football with youth. We won, by the way, just, in case, just so you know. <laughs> but, but I ended up being hurt for weeks, right? But, but here's the thing. The older I get, the more I realize that this body is temporary. This body is not my home and is not the end of my story. But when we give our life to Jesus, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about heaven. We step into, he transforms us into something incredible. That in heaven, we're not going to take the brokenness that we have in this life he says, this isn't our home. We get to step into perfection. This side of eternity, we're not going to have that. But we get to step into that in heaven. We, we get to be with God for eternity. And he reminds us that that's the greatest thing that brings us joy. Is understanding who God is. And the fact that he wants to love us for the rest of eternity. Isn't that just incredible that the almighty, all-powerful God looks at us and says, I choose you, and no one can take that away from you. So no matter what comes into your life, you know your future. No matter what ailment you have in your life, no matter what is broken or becomes broken in our physical body, we already know our future. So because of that, we could step into whatever situation with joy because this is not the end. It's just the beginning of an incredible story for eternity. That's the promise that we have as believers. Listen, if you're here today and you don't have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, God wants to do incredible things in your life. This series is all about stepping into a future of joy, but you know that God wants to give you joy today? That he can help you through whatever stress, whatever issue, whatever problems you're going, you have in your life. God doesn't want you to do life alone. He never, he never intended for us to do life alone. If you go back to the book of Genesis, God says it is not good for man to be alone. You know, from that very beginning, he brought, he brought another person into Adam's life, but then God has always been there as well. You know, God doesn't intend for us to do life alone. He wants to, to us to, to have other people. That's what we talked about today, examples that can help us and, you know, and challenge us to live the life that he intended. But the most important relationship that you have is your relationship with God. And God says he loves you unconditionally. And he wants you to step into the future that he has for you, but it requires us to say, Jesus, I'm all in. If you've never taken that step, you can do it today. You can say, Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I know I've been pursuing the things that I've wanted to do, but I know where it's left me, and I know it's going to lead me to an empty place. 
Father, I want to pursue what you created me for. There's nothing more fulfilling than to knowing that you're living the life that you were created for. But it starts with saying, Jesus, I give you my life. If you're ready to take that step, you can do it today. Say, Jesus, I give you my life. The Bible tells us that our first step of obedience is to be baptized. It's our first action step. He said, if you're ready to do that, come talk to us. After service, we'll be right up here. If you're watching online, reach out to us. We have so many different ways you can reach out to us. Hello at UnleashedChristian.com. You can send us an email. You can message us on whatever platform you're watching right now. Because with Jesus, the best is just to come, church. Let's pray. Father God, we just want to thank you so much for today. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to step back and to remember that joy comes from you. You are the source of joy. That's why the Apostle Paul didn't allow situations, didn't allow circumstances, Father, to affect the joy that you gave him. And he writes such an incredible and beautiful letter, Father, to people that are in our culture that is trying to draw them away from you. And it's such a reminder for us, Father, as we live our life as well, that we know that this world is a downward escalator. It's, it tries to pull our faith. Help us to remember, Father, this side of eternity, we haven't arrived. So we're not going to stop. And we're not going to go backwards. But instead, Father, we're at least going to maintain. And then once we've catch, caught our breath, we're going to push. And we're going to reach to living the life that you intended for us. Father, not because we're trying to earn your love. You already love us. But, Father, because we're going to walk in that love. It is then that you help us have the life that changes our world. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.